Hello, and welcome to an intro to Anthro with two humans. I'm human number one, John McRae. And I'm number uh, human number two, John Lear. <laughs> That's my one line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you want to do it again? <laughs> no, uh, no, no. And this is a podcast where we reassess what it means to be human. And the title of today's episode is Free Willy or Free Wony, Free Will, Willpower, and the real reason why little Willie won't go home. <laughs> so, good, good luck fitting that one. Good luck fitting that one on. There. I'll have to. I'm gonna have to lower the font. I'm gonna have to lower the. I'm gonna have to go to ten point on yeah. that one. And I would, do not cut anything. Do no, not cut. No, of anything. course not. No. <laughs> and uh, just to give you a little background uh, story on today's topic is a few weeks back, John. This was actually one of your your ideas. Uh, you sent me an article, and it was a review about a new book by Robert Sapolsky called Determined, A Science of Life Without Free Will. Hmm. And Sapolsky is a professor of biology and neurological science at Stanford University. And in the book, Sapolsky argues against the existence of free will. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I know. I saw that. I was just like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. But you it makes very, sense. We're just yeah. machines. We're just <laughs> reacting to stimuli. <laughs> yeah. There's no there's only one way out of this maze. Yeah. Yeah. Uh which we'll get to. We'll discuss it. We'll discuss what's going on. But you seem very excited about it when you sent it over. Yeah. Was it, what was it that uh, appealed to you about? Well, I I love the notion that we think we're more um, in control of how our lives unfurl than we are. Like, I I always love that. And and for a scientist to prove (laughs) free will, I was like, what? Yeah. And he's no no slouch either. No, uh, no. He knows what he's doing. Right, right. Uh. So we'll get into that and we'll get into his book. And then uh, a couple of other, other things that happened. Uh, I was talking to my wife, Mary, about this episode. And she said, well, if you're doing something on free will, you got to title it Free Willy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we got that part. Uh, and then all of the talk about Free Willy or Willy got me thinking about, remember the song back in the 70s by the band Sweet, which was uh, Little Willy? Yeah, it was <laughs> it'll be a earworm now, you know. But it's, it's you say, uh, there's a line in the song that says, "Cause, cause little Willie, Willie won't go home, but you can't push Willie round. Willie won't go. Try telling everybody, but oh no, little Willie, Willie won't go home." <laughs> so, so it got me thinking if suppose he's right then uh it might not be that little willie doesn't want to go home it may be that Will- little willie doesn't have the uh the, he's not able to go home he doesn't right. have the free will to go home well he may want to <laughs> but that doesn't mean he's gonna get there right right <laughs> so um now i got that now it's a near worm for me like i said and now i've, I've just heard that in me the back too. of my mind uh, and then also, John, you know, this is the first week of 2024. Here we go. This is our, and- our, first, our second <laughs> episode uh, of the season, of our season right, two, right. which, by the way, we have uh, significantly topped 3,000 downloads. <laughs> and I know some people might be rolling their eyes out there, but let me just say, yeah. you got to have 3,000 before you have 3,001. Right. Right. Well, actually, we have three thousand and uh, two. We're like thirty two hundred downloads right now. Really? Yes, really? we are. Yes, we are. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, Thank you so much. Yeah. Um. It, but but the thing is, with the you know New Year's, people are making resolutions. They're trying to, uh, uh, you know, resolutions undoubtedly, undoubtedly uh, have to do with uh, involve willpower. So people yes. are trying to change their lives, use willpower. Dry January. Dry January. Right. People decide <laughs> right. not to drink. Yeah. And then there's Veganuary, where people also, they try to stop eating meat. We're trying Ooh. to go vegan just for January. That's another one. Veganuary. I didn't know about yeah. Veganuary. I yeah, like saying yeah. Veganuary. Yeah, it kind of It's rolled. easy to do here in LA. Vegan food is <laughs> yeah. delicious yeah. out here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll I eat we, anything we at a vegan place. 
it's really hard. It's where we've talked about it before. You, it's hard yeah. to go out with people. If you're going vegan, it's hard to go out with people, your friends who aren't going vegan. Yes. Yeah. You can yeah. only you hang out go with to vegan. A, it's tough to go to a diner when you're vegan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everything. <laughs> Even sitting down on the, you've already consumed some yeah. sort of meat. <laughs> Sitting down on the on the bench. Yeah, try <laughs> booth. Either. It's easy to be vegan when you're in, uh, you know, when you're in Los Angeles. But try going vegan when you're at a TGI Friday. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Walking in the door, you've already inhaled a bunch of animal products. <laughs> They're already on you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, today, John, I thought we could talk about free will, willpower, and the real reason why L- Little Willie won't or possibly can't go home. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay. This is so, be, this one. I'm sending this one off to the Webbies. This one. Really the yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Let me listen to it first. Let me listen to it first. Don't do anything crazy. Don't do anything <laughs> all right. Crazy. All right. Suddenly they start taking away our downloads. <laughs> <It's> like, people, <laughs> people, <laughs> somehow you guys are back down to 200. You know, <laughs> people have returned them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so anyway, John, do you have, I'm going to, going to ask you, do you have any new year's resolutions for, for this year? No, no, I don't. Uh, (laughs) I have zero. Um, I just, you know, because I've learned, I know I, the, I don't have any willpower. I have zero Mm -hmm. willpower. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm good at getting stuff done, I guess that, so there's willpower involved in that, but I'm really, I've over the years realized all I can do is the next indicated action. You know, the, I yeah. can do the next thing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. I do think ahead. I have long term projects and everything. But I, I, I always, you know, you and I joke around. Willpower is wasted on people who don't need it. Right. You know. Right. <laughs> so because when I was trying uh, to drink, quit drinking, everybody was like, "Well, just stop." And I'm like, "You yeah, don't understand yeah. my brain at all." <laughs> we yeah, are very that. different people. <laughs> If it was that easy, I wouldn't be in this situation. You think I didn't uh, think of that? My resolution was to get us over 3,000 downloads, and I've oh. already got it. <laughs> oh, take the rest so of the year off. You're done. I'm done. I can do it. Excellent. Uh, Excellent. No, I used to uh, always take my resolutions very seriously. And mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. for a long, a large part of my life, I would like the time between Christmas and And New Year's, I would sit down and really kind of meditate and try to think about what I was going to try to do to make myself better, will myself to be better. I didn't know that about you. (laughs) I did not know that. Hmm. It doesn't Uh, surprise me. Well, it was, uh, remember in The Great Gatsby, at the end of The Great Gatsby, Gatsby's dad shows up. Yes. And spoiler alert if you haven't read it. But he gives Nick Carraway the, the... uh, narrator, he gives him a book that Gatsby had had when Gatsby was a kid. And in the back of the book or written in the margin somewhere, it's all of the things, so the routine, the things that Gatsby wanted to do to make himself a better Into person. the Gatsby. Yeah. 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 And uh, that's kind of what I did. I was like a cross between Gatsby and Gatsby at that point without the money. <laughs> And uh, that kid from Breaking Away who thought he was Italian, right? <laughs> like he was Italian, you know? That's how I was. So you started um, shaving your legs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but the thing is, I was trying to will myself to be a better person. Yeah. I think it, what it was. Yeah. And uh, that's got me thinking now, like, why is it at the beginning of a new year that we set resolutions for ourselves to become better people. Why at that time period exactly? Well, it's a and, restart. It's a birth. Mm, it's a, you know, it's a, a you know, you hitting the, hitting the do over. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're hitting yeah. the button. Okay. That didn't work out. 2023 right. was not so great. Well, Let's start it again. 2024. Here we go. <laughs> just Jay, Mary <laughs> sent me a cartoon, which I, I'll have to find it and I'll post it, but it's very funny. It's just like this sobbing little cartoon changing just changing the date changing three to four for the, for the, for the resolutions of like quit my job do and start my dream job or something you know? uh but i came across a an article from 1951 by isidore thomer titled the new year's resolution in ascetic protestantism mm, and I this was kind of <laughs> this was uh interesting because thorner 
sees a relationship between what we do as a New Year's resolution now and the ascetic Protestantism of England in the 17th and 18th centuries. Mm. Mm. And, and of course, by ascetic or asceticism, we're talking about, uh, you know, these practices that entailed severe discipline, self-control or abstention. God damn, that's where we come from. No wonder we're so unhappy. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and Thorner said, back. this was back in 1951, but he said, you know, the aesthetic Protestants had a, <clears throat> quote, strong moral conviction that the godly man can and ought to control his emotions in behalf of a rationally organized life devoted to bringing out the kingdom, kingdom of God on earth. Oh, let me yawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're on this rock for a blink. A yeah, blink. Yeah. And that's yeah. how we spend it. The <laughs> Protestants <laughs> really screwed us up, man. Yeah. It was, yeah, it's it was brutal. pilgrims. Who knew? Who yeah. knew what that how that would Rick start a domino effect? Yeah. And everybody was they were only living to like 35, 40 anyway. It's like oh, how much, how much uh, indulgence were you having at that time? You know I what know. I, mean? I, I, mean, how, I don't know if this happens to you, but because of my lifestyle and, 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 you know, who I, that I live, a, you know, a, a unique sort of lifestyle outside of the sort of uh, nine to five uh, thing. I, I have a lot of friends who say, God, I wish I'd sowed my oats more when I was in yeah, my twenties. And I'm looking at them going, what the hell were you doing? What were you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. you know, did everything in my 20s. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, and uh, God, you know, and then you you look at like these, I don't know if you've uh, read the, or heard, I'm sure you've heard of the book Tiger Mom, uh, which is about no. this mother who, no, okay, I Tiger haven't. Mom is kind of infamous in the parenting world of this mother who, you know, took ev ev hammered her kids <laughs> with stuff to make yeah. them get basically get them into Harvard. You know that that basically, you know, right, you constantly right. there's no time Ugh. to be a kid. Ugh. And uh, I don't know if you've met, you know, people who go to Ivy League schools, but you know, I and I, I don't want to generalize, but yeah. I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of unhappy people. A lot of unhappy yeah. people. They don't seem um, joyous, right? They seem, right. yeah. They're they're rich, yeah. But I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll have to look into Tiger Mom. I'm gonna. Oh look God, it. you're gonna die. She is so hard on them. My God, yeah. she's yeah. a drill sergeant. She thinks being a mother is being a drill sergeant. Wow. And she's coming from a good place. She wants to give them the best chance in in life, but yeah. Um, you know, I go play, know. go practice your piano and then go to your jujitsu and then your tutor's <laughs> yeah. coming over and then you've got to do volunteer work because that looks good. And then, yeah, then you end up that. 45 and you don't know how to interact with people or what to do. Exactly. With or, or you get laid off from your job. That's beyond your control and you have no idea what. Right. Right. <sighs> um, but anyway, back to Thorner. Thorner says that, uh, you know, usually these ascetic Protestants, uh, their belief system entailed a high degree of emotional control founded on effective repression. Hmm. So by effective repression, we're talking about, OK, you got to give up something. <laughs> you don't want to be dancing or drinking or smoking. It's like you don't do anything. You know what Jesus. I mean? And basically it was control your emotions and and don't give in to your vices. And. And for Thur Thorner, one of his examples was John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist Church. And, and Wesley used to, uh, he would expel people from the Methodist movement, uh, anybody who showed a lack of emotional discipline. Oh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have lasted a week. <laughs> Me neither. The Me neither. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, part of the reason why you're coming to a movement is you want discipline. And then it's like, like okay, yeah, you don't yeah. have any discipline. Get you're out of out. here. You know? yeah, yeah, we're not going to show you how. We're just kicking yeah. you out if you don't have it. <laughs> uh, and then Thorner says, you know, this ideal of the emotionally controlled man or woman remained part of English and therefore American culture, even after the initial Protestant fervor. Uh, fervor subsided in the 19th and 20th centuries. Yeah, for so, sure. Baked in. Right, right. And he says, therefore, it would seem reasonable to expect the development of some practice or custom acknowledging and expressive of the guilt feelings 
due to the breaches of the normative ex- expectation. And that's so where even- alcohol came <laughs> in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Even though it's not, we don't, it's not part of our, you know, it, it, it's not up in the forefront anymore, but yeah. as a culture, we still have that because that was the, the founding basis of us as an American culture. Well, for sure. I mean, you look at, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, work yeah. hard and, and the American dream will come to you. Uh, you know, that, that right there is, uh, you know, I think a direct result. Right, right. And that's what uh, Thorner goes in to say our, in his, I mean, this was his hypothesis, but his idea was, our idea of this New Year's resolution that we all do as a culture every year is the remnant of that Protestant asceticism of like trying to give up something, repress our emotions, uh, try try to do something to make ourselves better. better yeah, people. because, you know, it is such a rejection of who we were the previous year right. that somehow right. that was bad. And right. now we're going to improve ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And as he says, you know, the New Year's resolution is a determination to control what are felt to be weaknesses of character. Right. (laughs) And it's so so self-obsessive. It's such navel-gazing. You know, it's just me, me, me. I'm going to focus on me getting better. And it's usually to get something, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, you know, we yeah, we're going to stop drinking, but it's because we want to move forward in our career or, you know, we want to yeah. get, a, 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 a you know, a significant other or we want a better body. You know, it, right, we gain right. we gain through these New Year's resolutions and it's there's very little focus on anybody other than us. Right. Uh, right. You know, and, and if you think about it, it's it's all about giving up something. Again, it comes back to that repression. Yeah. Usually it's like, yeah. I'm going to stop eating. I'm yeah. going to I'm going to work out. It's something that you're f- trying to force yourself to do, trying to will yourself to do. So. Yeah, I mean, isn't that connected to Lent? I mean, isn't that where did, where did the Catholics come into all of this? Yeah. Well, I mean, Thorner says there's a difference between this pro- Protestant asceticism and mm. like what you have in Lent or Ramadan. Mm-hmm. Uh, for uh, Yom Kippur, for Muslims, yeah, right, yeah, where because you're making are... the mundane mm-hmm. holy. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. You know, you give up smoking to remind yourself that you you to make it godly uh, or to, right. to yeah, I get you, okay, yeah, and also you know when you give up something for Lent, you're doing it for what forty days. You're you're not right. saying that this is going to be something I'm giving up forever. Right. And that's what the, the uh, you know, for the Protestant asceticism and for New Year's resolutions, when you make it, even though we all know probably you won't keep it. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's the it? thing. It's a fool's errand. You're no, you yeah. know you're going to fail. Yeah. yeah. Eventually. Yeah. And, and you, but you, you make it as if you're in your mind or you're publicly pledging, I'm giving this up. So, uh, because people always tell what their New Year's resolutions are. And the idea is that this is for the rest of your life. This is going to be a change that will change you forever. And in a sense, that way, it's like being, you know, the pledge that you make when you're born again as a, you know, Christian or Mm -hmm. when you, or or like, remember how they used to have for alcoholics too, there was the taking of the The pledge. pledge. You would stand up in front of everybody, go down, make the pledge as if that was going to change everything from that day forward. Yes. Yes, <clears throat> we're in control. We're in the driver's seat. Anything right. that's going wrong in our life is our fault. Right. We've done something right. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's that's where it comes down to that uh, that repressive, you know, like you, it's you, you're wrong. There's a character flaw in you because mm. you give in to these vices or you give in to these things that you shouldn't be giving into. Mm. And therefore you have to change, you have to will yourself to be better. Um, it was also interesting in this article by Thorner. Um, it was written in 1951, like I said, and he has a list of the common New Year's resolutions of 1947. Oh boy, this is good. <laughs> and, and it's basically the same as what we're doing now. Like oh, number really? one, yeah, like number one was improve my disposition, be more understanding, control my temper. Oh, like that's I think nice. Say, I like that. Yeah. yeah. But you, the, it, it, but the, here's the thing: you wouldn't have a temper if you could control it. Of course, you can't control it. Your your frontal cortex gets flooded, yeah. and you you're a dick. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You can't just say I'm going to stop being an asshole from January first. You know, <laughs> right? It's just 
It Only takes an a little more work than say that. that. <laughs> it takes a little more work than that. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's a little vague, other... too. A little vague. Yeah, yeah. The other one was improve my character, live a better life. <laughs> so mm. That's kind yeah, of like. That's vague. Okay. okay. Yeah. Then we start getting into like the common way, like stop smoking or smoke mm. less. I always like people smoke less. It's like, yeah. well, you're not going to be smoking less. You're well, not gonna be. I had a friend and I, I, I'm sure we've all known this guy who would keep a pack of cigarettes around and, uh, you know, he'd have one every now and then yeah. when he wanted yeah. one. And I was always mm. like, what's wrong with you? I yeah. hated that. I was like, <laughs> yeah, no, I you smoke them all and then you go buy more. Yeah. Yeah, immediately. One immediately. after the other. One after, after the, the other. other. Chain smoke. Yeah, you were an amazing chain smoker. You were one of those smokers who would light the tip of his cigarette with the previous oh, yeah, one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't lose a connection. Don't lose a connection. Yeah. Keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> Round the horn. Round the horn. Round the horn. Uh the other one we get down to is uh lose weight, which people still say yeah. that one. Yeah. And then back then there was one. In 1947, gain weight. Really? <laughs> was, yeah. You know, we need time. to bring that back a little bit. <laughs> I, we need that back a little bit, especially yeah. out here in LA, especially when you get older. The old adage is it's either your butt or your face. <laughs> you know? <laughs> What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, I, I think I, I think it means if you lose too much, you're uh you 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 yes you lose your butt, but uh, yeah. you're it's at the expense you start getting that gaunt uh, look oh, okay. if you get too thin. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> but but isn't that amazing? There was a time where people were uh, like as a whole were too thin. Like, I, yeah. like well. you know, after the depression and everything, people were like. You got to put on weight, you know. You hardly well, ever hear that anymore. You know, it's so funny. I, hmm. I saw on, uh, on online somewhere they were showing muffin pans from the before the 1950s and muffin <laughs> pans after the 1950s. Yeah, and they just yeah. Get bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger. You know, <laughs> yeah. it, it's like uh, like like when people back in the 30, 20s or 30s, you would have one chicken for the entire family. Right. You know? <laughs> Everybody would, and now it's like. <laughs> you bring out one chicken that's like we're one person and yeah oh you, you know still hungry I mean. go upstairs and think about how you're going to be a better person <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh so then we go well how successful are new year's resolutions at making lasting changes in other words how successful are we at controlling and improving ourselves oh boy <clears throat> mm-hmm. yeah and in a 1972 article titled behavioral self-control power to the person Michael J. Mahone, Mahoney and Carl E. Thorison looked at self-control and willpower. Mm. And they say that the term self-control has meant different things to different people. It's more popular synonym by far has been willpower. Yes. So they were getting back to willpower. Yes. And they say that that's a vaguely defined inner force. Which is what <laughs> you and I have talked about. Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, I think they're right. I think it's, we try to think of, well, how do you define willpower? You know what I mean? Yeah. Or like, yeah. you could say, well, it's a, you control your emote, but how, how do you do it? Yeah, right, right. You, you make a, there's a conscious d- decision that you yeah. make to change, to, to decide where you're going next. Right. What you're going <laughs> to do next. <laughs> right, right. But anybody uh, who's ever been to mm-hmm. Vegas knows that that oh, is yeah. not, does not exist. In yeah. because in Vegas you end up doing stuff that you have no idea, and you know that people smarter than you, like the way they yeah. laid out that yeah. we've talked about this, the way they lay out the you know the game rooms and the way that the lights, everything is yeah. thought through to just guide primates into putting their money into slots. You know, yeah. Yeah. You don't even have to go to Vegas. Go to the supermarket. Go yeah, to any go to supermarket. supermarket. You're right. <clears throat> and they have already, by the time you walk in the door, they are guiding you through yeah. making purchases. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so Mahoney and Thorson also say that the notion of self-control associated with the ideals of freedom and self-improvement is strongly embedded in our society, which is, mm. is true, I think. We like to be, we're free. We're free people. Therefore, my self-control, I'm in charge of my self-control. Well, it's terrifying to know that the, that you don't have control. You know, it's terrifying uh, to yeah. us, you know, 
Jesus Christ, if we don't have any control over anything, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> you know, we're just free falling. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty <laughs> depressing. And that's what they say. They say, you know, we value self-control because of its role in the survival of our society and culture. Yeah. Because one measure of a civilized society is the degree to which its inhabitants direct, maintain, and coordinate their activities without external coercion. Coercion. It's so funny because you look at crime, you know, and, and yeah. people who are anti-crime think, okay, we make the punishment more intense and it will make people, it will, you know, yeah. keep people yeah. from committing crimes, which study after study shows that's not the case at right. all. Right. Uh, right. And, you know, that's, <clears throat> that, that has very little to do. There's very little deciding to commit a crime, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. It, it, that, yeah. And, and I mean, look at January 6th. That was supposed to be, those were supposed to be the, uh, the party of law and order or whatever. It's like, where's yeah. your self-control on that thing? Yeah. Cut, you know what somebody I mean? was rubbing poo on the, you know, the walls yeah. of the Capitol. Right. Nobody right. decided that. Hmm. Uh, so, and then the, uh, Thorson and Mahomey, they say, well, how does the concept of willpower actually work? Which is what we talked about. And they say, well, you know, the person who demonstrates self-control by resisting a major temptation, such as a heavy smoker who quits cold turkey, mm. is often described as having willpower. Right. But how do we know he has willpower? Well, he quit smoking, didn't he? <laughs> so usually what we do, they're saying, like, we, we go back. It's like, well, we say he has willpower because he quit smoking, and therefore that proves... He had willpower. You know, or, I, I, when I quit smoking, it had very little to do with willpower. It was more just embracing pain. I just wanted more pain. Yeah. And the yeah. pain of quitting uh, was something that appealed to me because I was yeah. so depressed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, I, I know. <clears throat> yeah. We've talked about that before, but it was always mm. like seeing what your body can do, what your body yes. mentally and physically can do. Yeah. And and once you become addicted to something, then you get that same sort of, I don't know, thrill or whatever it is, that kind of a curious it's, thrill of like, what happens if I take that away now? Yes. You know? Right. Right. And you've got yeah. to enjoy not feeling that it's not fun. Yeah, you've got. To, <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, takes a very yeah. dark oh, soul. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, so in, in, anyway, uh, Mahoney and Thorson then say, you know, in other words, using willpower as an explanation for why someone stopped doing something doesn't mm. really explain the process of what happened. Yes, yes, because we don't really know what willpower is objectively. Exactly. Because each different, uh, uh, each di we can't generalize on this stuff. Each path right. is totally different, right? And uh, and 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 the dominoes fall different ways. But we yeah. all think, oh, he just decided, you know, to change it. And we love that story, that idea, like you said, of being reborn, of, yeah. of turn, you know, turning things over. I'm gonna be a new person now. Right, and we love right. seeing that in the movies, and and. Um, and and it's just not that simple, of course. Right. And and you know, I I quit drinking years ago on the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving night. I actually I was still drinking the night before Thanksgiving. It was Thanksgiving I quit. And was I with you on that Thanksgiving? No. Where were yeah. you? <laughs> I was in Chicago. And I oh, was all pissed right. off because everyone had gone home. Everyone had gone to because yeah. they were all getting ready to go to, to their families for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. And I was out there alone in all the bar and I was just so drunk and stumbling around Chicago trying to find an open bar. And, uh, and finally that next morning I woke up and I was so hungover and so sick and naked and just like <laughs> pasty. And I was like, I'm going to quit. I'm not drinking again. And I made that. And did I know if that, but the point is I had tried to quit many times before exactly that. many times exactly you had said that to yourself many hmm. times yeah why yeah. that time right so yeah. it wasn't just like willpower from this day forward no it was like many times saying willpower from this day forward you know hundreds of times before it actually actually took um but so getting back to mahoney and thorson say that if we're going to succeed at like quitting a behavior or, or you know, exhibit self-control and willpower. We must make efforts to control the situational cues in our environment. Hmm. And they say that success comes through recognizing that self-control is integrally bound up with immediate environmental considerations. 
Oh, okay. So in other words, and then they go on, they say during the past decade, we have again learned that an individual's ability to control his own actions is a function of his knowledge and control over situational factors. And basically, a rapidly expanding body of evidence indicates the, that effective durable methods of self-regulation can be established if attention is given to the significant relationships between the person and his environment. Situational football, <laughs> right yeah. there. Yeah, That's yeah. what made yeah. the New England Patriots so great. Uh, yeah. Well, that yeah. and having the best coach and quarterback in the history of football. <laughs> but but situational football. Let's let's be ready for whatever comes our way as best right, we right. can. As best we yeah. can, and then adjust on the fly. It's all process. Everything's process. Yeah. God yeah. damn it. And and control like, okay, if you have trouble uh, you know. Eating peanut M and M's, which is what I do. I'll use. My oh, I love those. God, <laughs> so, so, so do I. I can't stop. I'm just getting. Me neither. Addicted no. to them. Yeah. If you have a bathtub of them, I'm getting in the bathtub and right, I'm going to eat them. Right. I'm going to stick out my tongue and stick one to my tongue. Yeah. Over and over until that <laughs> bathtub <comes> empty. <laughs> That's an experiment. We gotta get it. We gotta get we'll a grab for that. We I'll gotta get a grab for that. You fill, <laughs> you fill a tub with peanut M and M's, and I'm gonna do it. Don't let him out. Don't let him out. <laughs> he can't use the bathroom. Uh, but the thing is, it's if that's the what my I'm addicted to these peanut M and it's probably not a good idea for me to have peanut M and M's in my house. You yeah. know what I mean? Yes. You have to. Yes. You have to control the situation around you that are your cues, your situational Unless cues. you want to flip it and you're going to put peanut M&Ms around, but then it's about <laughs> embracing the pain right, of having right. them there. You know, then it's a whole different kind of thing. It's not, it's still not willpower. It's self-loathing. Right. It's embracing <laughs> how much you hate yourself. Yeah. Because when I quit smoking, I kept a pack next to my bed just to Ooh. make me Ooh. want yeah. them. You know, just because I just like whenever I wanted a cigarette, I would put one in my mouth and I, th- yeah. I talked about this and light a lighter and hold it as close to the tip as I could just to watch <laughs> my hand shake. Yeah. <laughs> it was like my version of cutting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, yeah. Yeah. But, but it's uh, it, I don't know. What do you think would have happened if you didn't have that? in? It wouldn't have been at the forefront of you or of your mind of like, I, I can't do this. To- yeah, I don't think I would have been able to quit if I didn't hate myself so much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a situational cue. You control yes, the situation. Exactly. You control the environment. You made I'm the environment. I'm going to make this work. self-loathing work for me, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mahoney and Thorson, they give a really good example from uh, from the Odyssey, from Homer's Odyssey. Oh, and boy. remember, Mahoney. <laughs> God. Remember when uh, Odysseus he's he wants to hear the sirens. He wants to hear the song of the sirens. Yeah, you don't and, want that. You know, yeah, the song mm-hmm. of the sirens. You know, it becomes so enchanting. Yeah, you forget everything. You give up your job. Mm-hmm. You forget about mm-hmm. your. It sounds a lot like heroin. Yes, it <laughs> does. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> but remember, <laughs> it's like uh, he, he, he. But he wants to hear it. He wants to hear it. But what is he? He doesn't just go in and try to gut it out to hear, you know, to hear the sirens. What he does is he has uh, he has all of his crew tying to his the mass of his ship. And then he gives them the order that says, no matter what I say, if I tell you, even though I'm your captain, if I tell you to let me down, don't let me down. Okay, It's like the end. Uh, with yeah. Dom DeLuise and, and, <laughs> yeah. Bert, and Bert Reynolds, where Bert says, Bert hires Dom to kill him. And he says, no yeah, matter yeah. what I say, <laughs> yeah. no matter no. what I say, you got to yeah. kill me. Yeah. And then you, that, you have a comedy right there. Boom. Right, right. And 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 then, you know, Odysseus, he tells his, his crew, too. He has them all put beeswax in their ears so that they mm-hmm. can't hear it. So yeah, and they smart. also can't hear him. So right. in other words, he's he's not just going in trying to willpower himself to resist the the right. sirens. He's using technology, he, <laughs> rope yeah, and wax. Yeah. <laughs> he's controlled the environment. He's yeah. made it to where he's helped it. So in other words, he willpower. He outfoxed the sirens. Right. Exactly. And uh, so in other words, I guess that the take out of this is like, yeah, willpower. Willpower is good. But uh, willpower needs help. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> <Everybody> needs help. <laughs> it's one facet. Hmm. It's one part of of change of successful right. change. To right. want it is only one part, and and I think that's where we've gone wrong because of the goddamn Protestants. <laughs> <laughs> Blaming we'll it all on out. them. We'll leave, we'll leave that out there. We'll leave that out there. Uh, so what was it? Johnny Cash was supposed to have kicked amphetamines oh. kind of in the similar way, right? He had himself yeah. locked in his basement or something like that. <laughs> don't, whatever I say. Don't, don't let, let me out. out until I'm cured, until I kicked it, you know. <laughs> okay. I changed my mind. Let me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't no, <laughs> you said no matter what. I know, I know, I know. I know I said that, but <laughs> you know what? I think <laughs> <laughs> when I get out, I'm going to kill you. Johnny, yeah. you said. Yeah. yeah. Long pause. Okay, let me out. <laughs> let me out. Yeah, yeah. Let me out. I, or, or like after 20 minutes, like, okay, I'm clean. I'm clean. I'm <laughs> 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 so if you've heard him in there just tearing up the room okay it's out devil's Done. out devil's out <laughs> devil's out <laughs> um so anyway all of these ideas of willpower and self-control sound reasonable and make sense as long as we have free will <laughs> <laughs> right exactly or, or the will to consciously control our own actions yeah. But but what if we don't have free will yeah. and we really aren't in charge of our own actions? What do we do then? Yeah. Surrender. <clears throat> yeah. That's and that's essentially do. the argument of Robert Sapolsky's book, Determined a Science of Life Without Free Will. Sapolsky, again, like we said, he's a biology and neurology professor. And he basically comes out and says that all of his research in biology, evolution, genetics, and ne- neurology has led him to the conclusion that we don't have free will. Yeah. <laughs> and, and right there, I, I'm putting a big question mark hmm. because how many times, uh, yeah, that if somebody's knowledge of everything led to the world yeah. is definitely flat too, <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right. I know it's hard. It's hard. And even he will say that he's not comfortable with that conclusion. Good. That everything is already determined. Good. Cause but I he's... have something for him to give up. For one. <laughs> But he says there's no other conclusion you can make. And Mm. I I wish we had time to go into this entire book because it's a fascinating book. And he's a great writer and he's able to communicate in a way that everybody, including me, can understand. (laughs) Uh, And he's funny. He provides examples. uh, But we don't have that time. So I'm going to just try to focus on just some of the, the main points out of his book. But Just if you use get a your chance. willpower to, to, to <laughs> distill this book for all of us. Yeah. yeah. I've tried to keep this, use my willpower to keep us down to like an hour, hour and 10 Good. minutes or something. Good. Uh, but before we begin talking about Sapolsky's book, we need to get a little background on what exactly we mean by free will. Yes. And to me, honestly, I've always considered the question of free will to be something only philosophy teachers or philosophy students in college. And, and maybe preachers uh, think about. And other than that, I've, I've just always concluded that we're in charge of our, you know, our own actions. Mm. Um, and in his book, Free Will, a very short introduction, the philosopher Thomas Pink says that the idea of being in control of how we act, the up to usness, meaning everything's up mm. to us mm. of our actions, is an idea we all share. And I think yes. that's true. I think most people like to believe that they're in charge of what what they're doing. Yes, they well, I'm, you know, it's very it's Darwinian, isn't it? It's like that's how we protect ourselves. We're in charge. Right. If we, if 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 we thought all the time that a bus could hit us at any moment or an asteroid could come take us out, it, yeah. it's yeah. what's the point? We'd all kill off ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's going <laughs> beyond that even. It's like am I really making the decisions to guide my own life yes. or are those being placed or you know is is all of that predetermined somehow yes and and you know pink says you know however skeptical we may become when doing philosophy meaning college students who are taking an intro intro to philosophy course and suddenly are like just blabbing on about all this stuff (laughs) uh once we fall back into ordinary life we we all continue to think of how we act as being up to us and that's the up to up up to usness yeah. Uh, and he says, you know, thinking of ourselves as being in control is is what enables us to see living as something valuable. Yes. <laughs> so, you're, so you're absolutely That's what I'm right. saying. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because if, if it's not up to us, then then it's crazyville. It's chaos. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, are we really in charge? He asked, are we really in charge of our actions? The problem of whether we are ever in control of how we act and what this control involves is what philosophers call the free will problem. Mm-hmm. And And so this has been something that, you know, he says that the term will or what we consider a will has usually been uh, defined by philosophers to be a, a vital psychological capacity that all normal humans possess a capacity for decision making. Yes. So, so we consider our will or having free will as being a, a, a way for, or the, the freedom for us to make our own decisions. Yes. And you just got to look at self-help books, you know, or get rich yeah. quick yeah. books. Because every rich guy you talk to, then they are always like, yeah, I fell into this. I, I wasn't even thinking. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. The story always comes down to like, I, yeah, some guy asked yeah. me to invest in this. And I said, sure. You know, yeah. and then they're smart. Don't get me wrong. They're smart and, you know, make decisions and they're bright people. But they didn't, yeah. you know, it's not like looking in a mirror and doing affirmations to get yourself to be rich. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you hear none of them say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Pink Think says, you know, that this capacity Pink. to make dis- <laughs> this <laughs> capacity to, to make decisions or choices seems central to our capacity to control and take charge of our own actions. Yeah. And then he says, you know, freedom, true freedom, is always exercised through action, through what we deliberately do or refrain from doing, and through action alone. So you mm-hmm. can have, you can have you know, all the wants and feelings and you can have all your desires, but ultimately the freedom's going to come through your actions. Can you actually put those wants and desires into action? Yep. And, and that I think is what kind of, you know, comes down to when we're talking about freedom is I I could be in a, a prison cell, for example, and want to be free or have a desire or like a, a dream of being free. Mm-hmm. But that's not really freedom unless I can get out of that prison cell. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it is because you can <laughs> become free uh, right. in, in a prison cell. Like that, like I think that's where the, all of this is <clears throat> going is that it's it's just not out just because of what we think should leak should come from our our willpower. If right. we give up that idea, then we truly do have free will. Yeah. Yeah. Because we're only a, measuring it in results. Right, right. That's interesting. That's an interesting thought about it. <laughs> um, so he says, you know, over the past 2,000 years, uh, the free will problem has essentially boiled down to a few different schools of thoughts. And the first one are called the libertarians. And I'm not talking yeah. about the libertarian, the political libertarian. I'm not talking oh, about Ron those Paul. guys. <laughs> I was following a guy in a, a libertarian last night uh, on the road, and yeah. I was just like, "Hey, you're driving within the lines, <laughs> yeah, yeah. libertarian." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's uh, th- those guys always like Ron Paul always kind of seemed to make sense when he was talking about uh, like weed about marijuana, and then uh-huh. it, you'd be like, oh, "Okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense," and then he'd go off and say something completely racist or something. <laughs> be like, wait a second, wait a second, wait, wait, how did we get here? Yeah, let's get back to the weed. Let's get back to the weed. Uh, but we're talking about these philosophical libertarians when it comes to uh, the free will problem or the yes. free will issue. Yes. And and what they John argue Stu- is- The John Stuart Mills out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they argue that we have free will uh, and that we are truly free to act without any connection to what has happened before. Mm-hmm. So in other words, uh, we're free agents to do whatever we want in this world. And again, we're talking about philosophical libertarians and not political libertarians. Yeah. But in other words, what, what the philosophical libertarians would say is if I have free will, I should be able to do something completely novel of my own free will that is disconnected from the events that preceded it. Yes. Doesn't this always lead to suicide? These guys. (laughs) It's always like you should have the you should have the the freedom to kill yourself. Right in the end, it always comes down to that. Um, Yeah. So, in other words, to be truly free, you have to. Yeah, you had things that led you up to a certain point, but you should be able to just 
go in an entirely different direction. Yeah. To do Hit the otherwise. Reset. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Not anymore. That was the old me. This is the new me. <laughs> Boom. Right. It's, it's completely different. You know what I mean? It's completely yeah. different than what led you up to that point. <laughs> and on the other hand, you have the causal determinists. And according to yeah. Pink, the causal determinists say that everything that happens, including our own actions, has already been causally determined to occur. Yes. Everything that happens results from earlier causes, causes that determine their effects by ensuring that these effects must occur, leaving no chance for things to happen otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. It's all a machine. Right. Reality right. is this machine and that, it, <clears throat> yeah. And, and so, or like what happened, what I'm doing right now, what I'm thinking right now is due to what immediately preceded immediately it. Immediately preceded which, it. Right. Which right. was due to what immediately preceded that which was due to what immediately going all the way back. Yes. So I'm, I'm just on a chain. I'm on a train, just go reacting to what immediately preceded. Yes. I'm... Yes. Isn't that like what chaos theory is, is that like, uh, it, 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 you know, we can go all of these infinite, uh, yeah, uh directions, yeah. <clears throat> but ultimately they, you can trace them back to why. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna yeah, that was we're gonna have to do that one too, because that's yeah, that's fascinating as well. Yeah, crazy Bill. Uh so Pink says, you know, if causal determinism is true, okay, then at any time what will happen in the future is already entirely fixed and determined by the past. Yeah. Oh Jesus. <laughs> so you see where we're going with this. We see where we're so going. So I just said this. oh Jesus because of some other reason. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and these two arguments they lead to other subgroups such as the incompatibilists who say that the idea of free will is completely incompatible with the idea of causal determinism. Okay, means- incompatibilist. <laughs> That's a terrible name. I know. They've got to re- some- rethink that. Rebranding. You need some rebranding. Yeah, incompatibilist. Jesus. Yeah. Not to me. How did, that's going to be a long bumper sticker to put on the back. Totally. Of your car. I was just thinking, like a softball team, we're the incompatibilists. Yeah. <laughs> Compatibilists. <laughs> uh, then you have the compatible, uh, the opposite of the incompatibilists, or the mm. compatibilists who say that uh, Pink says that they say that the up to usness of our actions, our freedom to act otherwise, is entirely compatible with our actions having been all along predetermined. So they're trying to trying to bring it back and like, yeah, everything's pretty much it happens based on what happened before, but yet we could still have free will in there. There's still, what? Room for I don't know. That sounds like your cake and eat it too, to me. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm anti-compatibilist. Certain- <laughs> <compat- laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think at some point it becomes so depressing that everybody has to try to come up with a way to, mm-hmm. to make it work, you know, that we still have control over it. Um, but and he says, you know, that's why most of us are still we're incompatibilists. Like we we like to feel that there's free will, yeah, uh, and that we we're in charge of our decisions. Yes, and to me, <clears throat> that's the kind of that's the interesting part of it is it's not whether free will exists or not, but our need to feel right. like there is <laughs> free will, <laughs> right, is right. the is the thing that's so cool. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to think of like I have no I'm just I'm I'm just on the train. I'm on the train. I have no idea where the train's going and it's But just in our heart me. of hearts we know that that is a part of being a human. <laughs> yeah. that you, we are just on the train because we realize all right. it all the time, Jesus. How did I get here? Uh, I'm just yeah. like everybody else. I'm just, you know. Yeah. So the yeah. free will I think is just isn't a big part of it just thinking of us as like a machine is that the free will is to make us think that we're it's self-obsession. It's to make us think that we're important. And so we're right. going to protect ourselves <clears throat> and yeah. live longer and propagate the species. Cause that's what it all boils down to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it ultimately, uh, well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it here in a second. We'll okay. get to it. So one of the things, I mean, this has been the philosophical argument for about, you know, 2000 years or more than 2000 years. Uh, you know, this debate between free will, people who believe in free will and people who believe in causal determinism. Okay. And, and then about 60 years ago, uh, neurologists got involved. Scientists got involved. Here we go. And they started putting electrodes on people and doing, uh, 
encephalo or electroencephalograms. Yeah. To see what actually happened to the brain or in the brain when we decide to do something. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And in 1983, a researcher named Benjamin Labette conducted an experiment to determine what happens when we decide to do something. Or as Andrea Lavazza says in the article, Free Will and Neuroscience, Labette's experiment focused on the allegedly allegedly unconscious intentions taking place in decisions regarded as free and voluntary. Mm. Okay. So he wanted to see like how, what's happening when we think that we're taking a free and voluntary. I action. can't wait to hear what the experiment is. What is it? <laughs> well, well, that's, how did he boil it down? So he hooked up EEGs to, to all of the subjects. Yeah. And then he invited the participants to move their right wrist and to purport, to report the precise moment when they had the impression that they had in, decided to do so. So he hooks <laughs> them up. Yeah. Your right and then, wrist. What a right, weird thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he, he had a big clock in front of it. So the idea was you would, would, all right, move your right wrist and tell me when you think you've made the decision to move your right wrist. Uh, what? So, this is yeah. crazy, Bill. I don't understand. Yeah. I'd be a terrible uh, <laughs> participant. I'd be like, wait, what? Yeah. No, it, it could be anything. And people have always, because this has become the big scientific right. experiment, the watershed mark, the benchmark for any scientific study of free will is the Labette experiment. Yeah. But other people did it with fingers. So if someone says, yeah. okay, you move your finger, but tell me when you have made the decision to move your finger. Okay. So usually I would be like, I'm going to move my finger. And then I would immediately move my finger. Yeah. After. It's like nanoseconds, right? Right, right. Millisecond. I'd make it, I'd make it weirder. Like you got to sing a, a C, a C sharp. <laughs> now, yeah. tell well, me when, when you yeah. decided to sing that. Yeah. So you, <laughs> but you, you could do it with that too, but you would say like, all right, try it now. Try it now. Let's try it. You tell me when you're going to do a C sharp and then do the C sharp. Right now. <laughs> okay, okay. So there, <laughs> there was a decision beforehand to, to do it. sing the sing sharp. Yeah, okay. And there was a true. little bit of a time lag between the decision to do it and then actually doing it. That's right? true. Yes. So what Labette like found when though you when you jump off of a sorry, it's when you jump off of a cliff like into a, a lake. Have you ever done that? Like a 20 foot yeah, yeah. jump or something? And you get yeah. right up to it and you can't do it. Like your body <laughs> just won't do it. And you yeah, really yeah. have to decide. I guess that's willpower. You have to decide, I'm gonna do it. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Do I I when I look back on doing those things, I I never felt like I made a decision to do it. I just kind of did it. But but you had to Make somehow your body your body but, did it because of you. But I you were like in charge it was of more complicated than that. Like I kind of blacked out and did like part of me chose <laughs> to do it and part of me You know what I'm saying? I feel like it's more yeah, complex. Yeah. Do you feel like you had the freedom to do it? I mean, no one was forcing you to do it. They weren't Oh yeah, there was peer pressure. Hell yeah. <laughs> Everybody else was so, doing it. So there was. I did there it was out of a shame. Form. I did yeah. it out of shame. So it wasn't it wasn't a free act on your part. You were you were doing something that was forced upon you. Yeah, and I if you forced if, myself to do something I didn't want to do that my body didn't want to do, right? And, and that, was that I, free 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 will allowed you to do that? I guess is I what. Guess so I don't know. Jesus, yeah. I'm stupid. <laughs> this podcast is making me realize how stupid I am. <laughs> well, let's keep going. Well, let's keep it. We can't stop. But what Labette found was that there was action in the brain prior to when the subjects were actually conscious of their decisions to take the action. Okay. Okay. okay so in other yeah. words, about 350 milliseconds prior to becoming I consciously aware, yeah. <laughs> consciously aware of what they were going to do, the brain was already preparing to take that action. And so the argument was, if you're if your brain is preparing, like you could see the action in the brain preparing to move the wrist, yeah. Prior to you actually thinking or consciously saying to yourself, "I'm going to move my wrist," then you're responding to something that happened before. It's not Whoa. a free action. It's yeah. not a free action because something subconsciously is already provoking you to take that action. Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> so, yes. So, yeah. Jesus. Uh, and so anyway, what Lavazza says, you know, talking about Labette, is that the findings seem to show that our simple actions, and therefore potentially also more complex ones, are triggered by unconscious neural activity, and that the awareness of those actions only occurs at a later time when we think that we are willing to act. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I agree with that. It makes sense. You hear a lion roar, right? And you it takes time for that to just mechanically process, for the sound to hit the eardrum, the eardrum to right. it, take it, the brain decides what to do to it, and then you do it. You decide right. to do it. You decide right. to run. Right. Yeah. But you're just, you're not consciously deciding to run that. No. In other words, you're not making a free conscious choice. No, it's, you've just the been decision told. Ours, it's yeah. already been to, to, told by by the environment. Like you what know what? your reaction this to the environment. makes me feel better about myself for all the stupid <laughs> shit I, I've done. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> it that's wasn't the way my I'm fault. taking it. I know. That's the way I'm taking it. That's the way I'm taking it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's we're responding whether we not. I mean, according to this, whether we we know it or not, we're already responding unconsciously to environmental stimuli that are beyond our control, and yet we think that we're we're making a conscious decision. That uh, totally so, makes it. We're all little experiments as as to see which route is the is the superhuman race yeah, that's going to yeah. keep us around forever. <laughs> yeah. As soon as uh, soon we're going to have chips in our heads and then all of this will be for naught, you know, and yeah, we can just yeah. play video games in our brain. <laughs> can't wait for that. Oh, that'd be nice. Well, that's that's going nice. to be good. Yeah. To... Uh, but Lavazza says uh, an unconscious brain process has already decided what to do when the subject still does not know what she uh, would choose and think she still has the power to decide. Makes sense. Cause and, choice is a conscious, this conscious part, yeah, which is yeah. just one aspect of who we are. And usually the, the slowest part of us yeah. is the realization of where we are now is like the, you know, the, the part that takes energy, you know, that's right. why we meditate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, but then uh, Lavazza says that, you know, subsequent research in psychology also shows that our mind works and makes choices without our conscious control. So, again, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. And ultimately, Lavazza says consciousness, which should exercise control and assess the reasons for a choice, is thus allegedly causally ineffective, uh, a mere epiphenomenon to use the terminology right. of the philosophy of the mind. We trick so, ourselves into thinking we made the choice. Right, right. It, and this is, actually, <laughs> this is actually called the zombie challenge. Uh, it has a term, and it's based on uh, the amazing wealth of findings in recent cognitive science that demonstrate the surprising ways in which our everyday behavior is controlled by automatic processes that unfold in the complete absence of consciousness. Mm, so a I lot totally, of what we're <laughs> we're just sleepwalking we're zombies yeah. we're, we're just zombies. sleepwalking through life yeah jesus i knew it i knew it <laughs> isn't that i mean it's awful and also like fascinating as well I, and like, free I, back to it. Yeah. I just love the that i don't have to take responsibility for anything anymore yeah i didn't i just i'm zombieing man what do you expect <laughs> yeah sorry yeah. And Sorry, if you I cut about, you off. Like, how much of your day do you really remember at the None. consciously remember at the end of the day? Oh, and and I'm even lower than the average. I don't remember yeah. anything or doing anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, just... somehow, somehow you drive to work or you drive across town and you drive home, and I can't remember a single thing I saw no. or uh-uh. consciously I saw or remember. Our friend Carlos, who is a listener to this show. Is is one of those guys who can re- really remember things. Like he'll remember, yeah, pa- our past, and I can't remember any of it. Like I don't have <laughs> any recollection at all of doing yeah. a lot of this stuff. I'm yeah. just a I'm a zombie. How Jesus. about the media path? I, I can't remember things that we've talked about in this podcast. Like an hour I already ago. forgot what you just said. Now <laughs> I know. I know. I know. That's what's so uh, so frustrating about it. Um, anyway, all of this brings us back to Sapolsky's book, Determined, The Science of Life Without Free Will. 
And what, Sy- what Sapolsky says, when you behave in a particular way, which is to say when your brain has generated a particular behavior, it is because of the determinism that came just before, which was caused by the determinism which came before that oh, man. and before that all the way down. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And so – I guess that's why meditation and being in the moment <laughs> is so – spiritual to us yeah, because maybe yeah. it's just so true you know it's just yeah. we are here now that's all that there really is yeah and ever was but yeah and and to try to take yourself out of that chain for a second i guess maybe is what meditation would be. yes so like to cut off your stop yeah. making decisions stop thinking yes and exist like put it on pause for a sec for yeah. a few few moments and there's something so it's very <laughs> fleeting i mean people think when you meditate you're supposed to feel like that the whole time but you don't yeah you only feel in the moment for nanoseconds at a time and then you're immediately out of it but in right, those right. moments in those moments it's so it just feels so true yeah 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 i think you're right i think it's just yeah we're talking milliseconds we're talking yeah. milliseconds sometimes yeah. of getting outside of determinism and mm. and consciousness it's just mm-hmm. that little split second where you're like i'm free i'm free there mm-hmm. for a second mm-hmm. and, then, and then it's right back in you can't get yes out of it. right um but sapolsky says you know once you work with the notion that every aspect of behavior has deterministic prior causes you observe a behavior and can answer why it occurred as just noted because of the action of neurons in this or that part of your brain in the preceding second and in the seconds to minutes before, those neurons were activated by thought, memory, and emotion. And in the hours to days before that behavior occurred, the hormones in your circulation shaped those thoughts, memories, and emotions. Oh, my God. So in other words, how you're responding to your environmental causes, like we we're ca- talking about the environmental cues, has already already been programmed into you by what happened earlier in your in your mm-hmm. life, how you were being raised. And then you talk about the culture on top of that, human evolution, all of Genetics. these things. But yeah, what Sapolsky's saying, you're predisposed to to certain responses already. Yes. So and then if you add that to this idea of like we're just unconsciously responding to stimuli because yes. before we even become conscious of it then basically it's already determined how we're going to act. <laughs> so we should, so Sapolsky saying we should all just off ourselves because it's pointless. <laughs> we're know. just vermin. See, that's what he said. He says he knows it's hard. He knows it's hard for people to come to it, but he's also like, you kind of have to admit it, you know, yeah. or, you know, and, and one of the things people talk about is, uh, you know, they're always like, oh, this is ridiculous. If you take away free will like that, then what's the point of doing any of that? Or like people, it'd just be chaos. It'd just be chaos if people don't have to take responsibility for for their actions. And, and you know, Sapolsky, again, that's what he's saying is, yeah, you you still hold people responsible for their actions, but it would be our punishment for them should take into yeah. account that maybe they weren't completely in control of what they wanted to do. Yes. In other words, be- because our our sense of punishment from, you know, culturally is that um is Sorry. our sense of punishment culturally is that people are responsible for their actions and that's right. why they should be punished. Right. You know. And that boils down to free will because it scares us that somebody could commit a crime and not be conscious of it, that things are working in them that are causing, that are contributing to c- committing the crime because that yeah. scares the fuck out of us because that means any of us could do it and right. we're not in control of it. <laughs> right, right. It's like Isn't it- when you're, when you're driving down like impulse control, you know, you, you, yeah. you drive down the street on the highway and those two yellow lines are keeping us from just driving across them and smashing into the other person. And it's yeah. scary when you think about that, or if you're holding a knife and you're like, oh my God, I could just stab this person sitting next to, you know, or, yeah. or yeah. like, you know, any of those moments that we are, I could drive off the cliff, like all of those moments scare us. 
Right. Uh, right. And so it, that, that we are, that we don't have control, you know, it's just, that's really what it all comes down to. Isn't yeah. It? It, yeah. And, <sighs> and, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, one of the other things about it is, well, well, first of all, I'll say, you know, what did, what does somebody do whenever somebody commits a horrible crime? What they always say, that's not me. That's yeah. not me. That's not who I am. And it's and like, every, and the neighbors all say it too. <laughs> They're always yeah. like, he was a quiet. I never saw it coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, or if somebody says something really racist, really horrible. That's yeah. not me. That's I'm not, not me. I'm not, I'm not a racist. Yeah. I just said yeah. that. Yeah. But, and, and, you know, uh, one of the things, uh, Sapolsky talks about also is the, uh, the development of the prefrontal cortex. Like he gives a lot of examples in the book yeah. and he talks about the development of the prefrontal cortex. It always pre- comes down to the prefrontal. <laughs> Here we yeah. go. And you knew I was going to say it. You knew I, I was knew already you were de- going determined. to it. Uh, but the prefrontal cortex in our brain is the part that like determines our sociability, how we react with others, the, you know, choices we make. Yeah. Um, and he says, you know, for example, childhood, uh, child, child abuse as a child actually deter it, it inhibits the growth of the prefrontal cortex or it, it influences the, it has an effect on the development of the prefrontal cortex. Amazing. So if someone is abused as a child, their prefrontal cortex won't be as developed or will be developed to not be as sociable as, as somebody who wasn't abused as a child. Makes sense. So then, so then that begins to determine how that person reacts in society. Yes. So when they get to be an adult and the prefrontal cortex isn't, isn't complete until like mid twenties or something, but then you yeah. get to be or like 30. Later now there's some people are saying in the, or it's close to 30. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> But you, at that point, you're an adult who doesn't have the same prefrontal cortex as, as other people. Else. Yeah. And your response has already been predisposed you to respond in a different way. Yes. To what other people just take as like, well, that's no problem. Yes. And, and so again, that, you know, Sapolsky says, this is one of the problems of when you say that there's no free will and everything is determined is because yeah. people as a culture don't know what to do with that. Because yes. not only are you saying criminals aren't necessarily completely responsible for what they did, mm-hmm. but he says also it's hard in our culture for where we try to say like, oh, people, um, you know, he really worked hard. He willed himself to be rich because suddenly you can't take, you can't take, uh, could, yeah, I mean, you're not responsible for that either. So right. all the things that and people try to And what's the one to... thing all rich people want to say? <laughs> they want to tell you how they did it. I you know, know. I know. They're all like, "Oh, well, you just got to work hard and put your yeah. nut." Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You got to yeah. be right. It's situational football, but you still somebody's got to fumble the ball and you pick it up. Yeah. Or somehow you're you had a bigger budget to get the bigger players on your team. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? It was right. already set up. Tom Everything Brady. was set up. Yeah, Ugh. it was already set up for you to to succeed in that way. Mm. And he says, ultimately, you know, at that point, people, you you look at it that way. And it's what you said, too, John. It's like it's very hard for us. Like, where's it's, the enjoyment in it? And <laughs> scary. It's fearful. Yeah. It's, it's scary as hell. Because, yeah, yeah. If, if you can't control whether you're going to be rich or not is one thing. If you can't control whether you're going to kill somebody or not. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, that's terrifying. That terrifying. Yeah, that is terrifying. So some of us are already predisposed to murder somebody and we don't even know it because we can't think that we're a murderer. We don't think right. that we're a murderer. Otherwise, if you do, it's like it's like if you think you're going to kill yourself, if you if you consciously think it, uh, chances are you're not going to do it. You know, because you're already working out the awareness of, oh, I yeah, feel like yeah. killing myself. It Because it, when people who try to kill themselves, they never talk about uh, deciding to kill themselves necessarily. Right, right. I think it's always in, just for um, through my work, I do a lot of training for suicide prevention and things. And it's always interesting that they think if you interrupt the if, if somebody's talking about saying I'm going to kill myself or mm. nothing's worth it. But if you interrupt that and kind of give it just 
just say like, are you planning on killing yourself? You know, yeah. or just something to kind of make them think for a moment, get them out of that thought. Out of that, uh, just um, ideation, that, that, that right, that, right. Uh, yeah, that trap, that groove that you're caught in. Right, right. But then, then now that, you're that saying you... all of that, you talking to them and interrupting, all of that's all predetermined. <laughs> It could be. I don't know what to think about all of this. I don't know what to think about Sapolsky's book, about free will. Well, you're predisposed to not know what to think. <laughs> I know. That's where you just go down. It's like a time travel movie. You know what I mean? It's like uh, you get a time travel movie. Every time travel movie at a certain point is like, wait a second, why are there two of them back there? Why are they? Oh, but hopefully, John, this gives us something to chew on for for the new year. Oh my god. Well, it, you know, there's this this idea of the multiverse of the of the of this yeah. infinite number of universes where every single uh, um possibility is being played out at the same time. Yeah. So yeah. you you interrupting you being interrupted with your suicidal ideation is in one universe. You not being interrupted in, is in another universe. Something else, another version of that is in another. And all of those spider webs going out in yeah. all of these yeah. different directions are all being played out in one way or another in all of these parallel universes. Yeah. What was that movie? Uh, everything everywhere all at once or whatever yes, did you see yeah. that went that was a yeah. great movie great movie that. yeah but again i would say so it was the spidey verse the... you know the spider oh, yeah. the i didn't see the spider verse oh it's good but but again like well who's the real us in all of that because in each of those individual multiverses we wouldn't have we would still be just responding to what happened previously to us exactly so the, the and that's the that's the fear that's why the that's why we have to propagate this notion that we're in charge of our our future yeah. because it's scary as fuck <laughs> to realize that we're not <laughs> yeah. Yeah. this it's is a good totally way to start terrifying. out 2024 <laughs> to start out 2024 so none of say- you're basically telling all of us not to decide anything or do anything because it doesn't matter anyway and if you do decide it's only because you were chose you chose to decide previously I'm, based on your genetics i'm not or, saying uh, anything i'm not yes, saying anything I'm you're just <laughs> something told you not to say that you're not saying anything <laughs> See, this is where and, and people get very mad. They get very mad. For Sapolsky's book, there are people who have written against it and they make valid arguments too, but it's very, yeah. they, people get very mad because they're scared. It's yeah. very scary. Terrifying. It's very scary. But I will say, uh, you know, I was in therapy for many years and one time my Thank shrink God. asked. God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I may <sighs> need to go back in after this podcast. <laughs> I don't know. You're doing great. Well, who knows? Uh, you are in you know. <laughs> There's a part of you that knows that you are going back into therapy. Yeah. But you know, my, my shrink once, once asked me, he goes, what would you do if you could get away with anything? If there were no repercussions, like oh, if you could yeah. do anything in your life and get away. And it may be something that all shrinks ask. Yeah. And maybe people can think about what would you do if you could get away with anything? And honestly, John, I sat there and I thought for a long time and I said, Nothing. There is nothing I would do differently. There is no crime I would go out. I wouldn't go out and attack people. I wouldn't. I would live my life exactly the same way as I I am now, even knowing I could get away with it because it's yeah. just the right thing to do. And and yeah. and again, I think that comes down to how I see free will and determinism. I really don't care if it is determined or if, if everything's determined, and I just have the impression that it's free. Yes. I'm still going to try to be the best person I can possibly be and treat people with compassion and treat people with respect, even if there's nothing in the end, even if it just plays out. So it, so you're saying it doesn't really matter which choices you make. It's the sort of that that present moment of, of right. love and openness that is all there ever was anyway. Right, right. And and if you want to get, I mean, we can't get into everything that, that the book talks about, but, but keep in mind, you know, we always thought that on a macro level, physics, uh, Newtonian physics uh, responds in a certain way. There's certain laws that are, you know, incontrovertible for Newtonian right. physics. 
But then in the last few decades, we've realized on a quantum level, on a very small level, there is, you know, there, there is chaos or we can't chaos. tell what happens. So who knows You're what talking actually... talking about string theory. Yeah. Yes. And, and that happens over and over and over with humans. We constantly think we have it figured out and then we don't. Yeah. And it scares us, but it... I guess there's a part of me that it, that's filled with wonderment about that, that yeah. I, you know. Yeah, so I I don't know God, where depressed. this is all going. <laughs> also, one other thing I'll say, my final closing remark is uh, a few, a couple months ago, I stopped in the uh, Fudge Factory in Uranus, Missouri. <laughs> there's a place called the fudge that's factory the end of the world yeah yeah that is the, the end of the world if you're in the fudge factory in uranus missouri <laughs> yeah it's a, it's everything in there is a pun it's all like yeah, the best <laughs> just, the best fudge comes that's from that's uranus but there was there was a shirt in there that said uh a t-shirt because they have a bunch of t-shirts that are really fun. i want a fudge factory yeah. from uranus missouri oh, t-shirt. next time i go through i'll get you god one. damn it uh, but it says uh, the T-shirt said, "Bad decisions make good stories." And mm. and, and again, I would say, I, I completely agree with that. I completely agree. It's your bad decisions are the ones that make good stories, and whether or not that is predetermined, or <laughs> whether or not that is my own free will to make a bad, you know, bad decision, it still makes a good story. I guess. Even if all of this is mapped out, even if all of it's mapped out. We're never going to know the map. Right. So who cares? Right. right. Who cares whether it's mapped out or not? Because to us, it's not mapped out. Our experience of it is that it's not mapped out. So whether it is or not, it doesn't really make a difference. Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, I think you've summed it up. I think you've summed it up well. Anyway, uh, Happy New Year, everybody. Thanks Happy for New listening. Year. Don't quit anything. Don't, Don't decide quit. to do anything. It doesn't matter. Even yeah. if you quit, it was already decided. So you didn't look- do shit. And you're not alone. You're not alone. We're all on this journey together. We don't know where it's going, but we're on this journey together. That's true. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend about it. And if you have a question or topic you feel humanity should know about, please send it in. Uh, John. Uh, human number two signing off. And this is human number one. Happy New Year's. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, John. We love you guys. Hang in there. <laughs> <laughs>